So in the past, we've talked a lot about uh, crystal structures, um, and I posed the question, well, how do we find out, how do we know what those crystal structures actually are? Um, and the answer is in this lecture, it's with x-ray diffraction. So that's going to be the topic of, of today's lecture. Before we launch into x-ray diffraction, I want to say a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum. What I'm showing you here is various types of electromagnetic waves, um, ranging from long radio waves up through visible light up to gamma rays, and then giving you the wavelength for each of those um, uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, waves. Now, to diffract light or to diffract any electromagnetic wave, uh, the diffraction grating must be on the order of the wavelength of the light. So if we look at... Um, we know a little bit now about uh, the atomic spacing of atoms and maybe the distances between those planes, and it's on the order of about a nanometer, so right about in this region. If we want the atomic planes to diffract an electromagnetic wave, we have to choose an electromagnetic wave that's in that regime, which means that we must use x-rays, okay? So before we talk about how and why this works, we need to uh, talk about constructive versus destructive interference. I hope it's something that you've seen before, but if not, I'm going to quickly go through this and, and uh, hopefully walk you through it. So let's go ahead and consider multiple beams of, you know, this, these, are, these are electromagnetic waves um, from, of the same wavelength, lambda, that's the wavelength, impacting some surface. Okay, so there is uh, the blue and the red are, are the impacting waves. Their wavelength is given by lambda here. So there's our incident waves we'll call as blue and the red. And if we see what signal results, we, we are summing those waves, and so our resultant signal is magnified, okay? When that happens, when the waves are all in phase, and they, they build on each other, then we call that constructive interference. In contrast, okay, if this is another, uh, it's the same waves, but, but they're slightly shifted, right? So we have incident waves just like we had before, but now one of the waves is shifted by uh, half of a wavelength, okay? So what that means is that they're always canceling each other out. And when that happens, we don't have any signal at all, and we call that destructive interference. So the upshot of both of these is that, is that when incident waves are shifted by an integer multiple of the wavelength, why an integer multiple? Because uh, if, if I shift this by one lambda, I just it looks the same. If I go by two lambda, it still looks the same. You know, everything stays, uh, stays the same. Uh, if we shift it by an integer number of uh, a multiple of the wavelength, then we have constructive interference. If it's shifted by some half wavelength, like n plus one half times lambda, then we have destructive interference. So that n lambda term is going to be uh, critical as we develop uh, the formulas that we need for x-ray diffraction. So what we want to do is we want to consider parallel planes of atom, atoms in a crystal as solid planes that are going to diffract incoming x-rays. So here's some fictitious set of atoms that form a plane. Obviously, I'm in 2D, so it's hard to show the plane. But these are, uh, we're kind of looking, in, looking into the screen, so the, the planes are, uh, are into the screen. So here's our planes. I'm drawing a line through them. And they have some spacing D, okay? Now... What's going to happen is I'm going to have an X-ray source that's going to generate uh, consistent wavelength X-rays that is that I'm going to direct towards the towards the um, the sample, and they are going to diffract and come off of the sample. So the the incident at which they come in is measured by theta, and uh, in diffraction they come off at the angle theta like this. Okay, so. Again, lambda is, is given by is the wavelength of these rays. And what do we know? Well, we know that this second, if, if, if this green top green one is labeled ray number one, this uh, bottom one is ray number two, this number two, in order to get back to the detector, has to travel an additional distance that I'm highlighting here in pink over what this uh, ray one traveled, okay? That distance, you can go do this with uh, your, your high school trig and see that it's 2d times the sine of theta, okay? Now, we also know, we just showed before, that we want constructive interference to get the maximum signal. So for the maximum intensity, the x-rays must be shifted by n lambda. So 
if we set the maximum shift or the, the shift required for maximum intensity, set that equal to the ex extra distance traveled, we get what's called Bragg's Law, which says that N times the wavelength is equal to two times the inner planar spacing times the sine of theta, okay? Okay, so how does that relate now to uh, some of the stuff we've talked about with respect to planes, in particular, Miller indices. So uh, this is just specific to cubic crystal systems. And again, um, I know you may have questions about other types of systems, but that's, but cubic crystal systems is the focus of this class um, just to sort of keep, keep the scope manageable. <clears throat> so in cubic crystal systems, there's a relationship between Miller indices and the atomic plane spacing. That relationship is given as shown here, where the atomic plane spacing is D. And so we could take D and plug it into Bragg's law. So that's the plane spacing. A is the unit cell length of the cubic, right? It's FCC or BCC or, or simple cubic, I guess. But it's that, that unit cell length A goes there. And then the Miller indices, HKL uh, for that plane go uh, in the bottom. It's the square root of the sum of the squares, okay? So that's, that's how um, the Miller indices that we learned about when we talked about planes play into um, uh, X-ray diffraction and identification of um, uh, crystal structures and types, okay? Something I want to point out, though, is that Bragg's Law is a necessary but not sufficient condition for observing diffraction peaks. What that means is that if I satisfy Bragg's Law, I might see a diffraction peak. But it also means that if I don't satisfy Bragg's Law, I absolutely won't see a diffraction peak. Sometimes there can be other basis atoms inside the unit cell that actually causes um, uh, destructive interference so that it wipes out... Um, planes that, that you think you would see just based on uh, uh, plugging in the your Miller indices of this equation. Okay, so this is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Okay, let's do an example. How about x-ray diffraction of our favorite uh, uh, metal, polycrystalline alpha iron. It's BCC. Um, what we want is we want a sample that's going to show all possible orientations um, so that uh, our, our incident and, and um, uh, exit beam are, are going to capture at least some of the planes that are, that are oriented properly with respect to it. Um, and, and there'll be some plane that's aligned properly. But when we do that, um, we end up with something that looks like this. So what you're looking at here on the x-axis, this is a very typical um, x-ray diffraction pattern. So you see angle was going to be on the x-axis and intensity is going to be on the y-axis. And what you'll see is nothing, 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 boom, nothing, nothing, boom, nothing, nothing, boom. And so these three peaks, the 110, the 200, and the 211, uh, those are corresponding to planes inside the BCC crystal that are diffracting, okay? Um, Sometimes also, if you don't have a polycrystalline sample, but you still want uh, to, to do an x-ray diffraction on that material, you can grind it up into a powder so that you make sure that there's crystals, uh, some crystals oriented in the, the direction that you need to get a signal, okay? The thing that's, the takeaway from this is not that you should memorize uh, the, the signature of polycrystalline alpha iron, but rather that x-ray diffraction uh, is like a fingerprint. It's unique for each material. So we can not know what something is, put it in uh, an x-ray diffractometer and, and look at it and determine components, uh, what, what it's made out of, okay? So we can, we can do compositional analysis that way um, as well as uh, even decide whether a particular material is a crystal or not, okay? Let me give you another example of using x-ray diffraction. And it's observing phase transformation. So the case before, we just had polycrystalline iron and we wanted to see what peaks lit up when we hit it with, with x-rays. Uh, this is an example from uh, research that my group did uh, back in my PhD days at, at Cornell. Uh, so we were looking at depositing tantalum in thin film form. And as I think I mentioned before, we would deposit this uh, tantalum in what was called the beta phase, which is a highly unusual and it's a metastable phase. We'll talk about what that means later on in the class. And then we would transform it to the alpha phase, which was a BCC uh, tantalum uh, during heating. And how did we, but, but how did we know that was happening? Well, we used x-ray diffraction. So this is a, a figure from one of the papers from the, that uh, my group uh, uh, put out. 
And what you can see is the same thing. There's our, there's our angle on the x-axis and there's some intensity on the y-axis. And, and you have, now we have multiple lines and they're shifting them relative to one another just because these are uh, relative intensities. So this top curve here, that is the fully beta phase. That's as deposited. So after we made the thin film, this was the x-ray signature. And then you can see that we cycled it to 335, to 355, to 450, and finally to 600. And what you can see is that, it, that the peaks that, that define the beta phase started melting away. And then the peaks that define the alpha phase started growing. And so by the time we had cycled to 600 degrees C, we had a fully alpha phase, right? So that, that's just, an, again, a, an example of where it's used and why. Um, I want to I make one uh, uh, final uh, a comment about uh, assessing a crystal structure uh, and you know, orientation and those kinds of things. It doesn't fit in any other um, lectures, but it's not truly x-ray diffraction. And it's called electron backscatter diffraction. And so what it does is it uses electron diffraction. And I know if you're if you're like me, uh, you know you're probably going electron what? You know you think of an electron as a as like a, a moon <laughs> orbiting the atom. But if you go back to maybe what you learned in uh, some introductory quantum mechanics somewhere, you remember that electrons can behave both as a wave and a particle. And in this case, we're going to use the wave component of it to uh, to generate something called Kikuchi patterns. Uh, from which we can uh, determine the orientation of any crystal uh, on the surface. Okay, and so what we end up with are these really uh, pretty colorful maps, and each color corresponds to a different orientation relative uh, to the the laboratory or the or the surface. So it's easy to see the grain structure here. So that, for example, let's say this pink grain here versus this blue grain. There's a there's I'm not showing you the key here, but there's usually a key or a lookup table where you can say, oh, I see that uh, blue corresponds to um, a 100 direction pointing out of the plane, for example. So the, these colors are telling you which crystal direction are pointing out of the plane. It's a really handy um, uh, a tool to do a quick analysis of um, grain structures, okay? Uh, so uh, it's just, just something to be aware of. We're not going to talk in depth about uh, the physics behind why it works, but it's certainly a common um, uh, characterization method uh, now. And we have, uh, we have at least one at, at UW uh, that, that we use uh, on a fairly regular basis. So just be aware of that. It's, it's kind of a cool uh, analysis tool for, for looking at materials. So with that, hopefully uh, you feel at least a little comfortable with, with uh, x-ray diffraction. But I also want to say that the, the reality is you can take entire semester-long classes and read entire books on x-ray diffraction. You know, what, what I'm covering here in 10 or 12 minutes is not, um, is not an exhaustive discussion of it. But I want you to at least have a little taste of it uh, so that you understand uh, uh, the, how we come to know some of the things that we know about materials.